This is a video designed as a complement to a radio interview that I did on traveling to the North Pole on a nuclear-powered icebreaker and traveling to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or North Korea as it is more commonly known. Fasten your seatbelts and put your tables in the upright position. This is CFRA Travel Talk. Presented in part by Expedia Cruise Ship Centers, Canada and Westboro locations. We're ready for takeoff. Here's Elliot. Welcome to another Sunday in Travel Talk on News Talk Radio 580 CFRA. Elliot Finkham with uh, you. And I uh, hope you had a great week and uh, are enjoying our wonderful summer here in Canada's capital. I've got an absolutely special, special show today. We're going to go totally away from the norm. My guest that's going to come up in a couple of minutes, we do our normal housekeeping, as, as you know, uh, is going to talk about probably some of the most interesting travel uh, I've had the opportunity to, to, to work with a guest on. And uh, uh, we're going to start uh, with one of his trips and then we'll, we'll see how much time we have and, and, and maybe touch a few of them. Um, how about going to the North Pole? That would be one topic we may get to. Uh, we may talk to a couple of the others, the Galapagos. He's been uh, Polynesia. The most uh, unique, well, maybe it's not, I'll ask Thomas, that's this question when we get to him, is he just came back from Korea. And not what you might think. He went to North Korea. And, uh, you know, given all the situation, I thought, how fascinating, what an amazing trip. So we're going to get what it's like and, and, and from somebody who's just been to North Korea, and we're going to talk about that. A uh, gentleman's name is Thomas Harbour. He's a great uh, uh, guest of ours and, uh, and friend of the show, and uh, he's agreed to come on and, and chat about that. Uh, into it right away, because I think we're going to have a, probably one of the more fascinating hours on travel talk that I've had in, in quite a long time. Not that they're all not interesting. I mean, they're all interesting. But don't forget, you can grab these on the podcast if you can't listen live right now. If you've got to tune out uh, for whatever reason, it's at uh, TravelTalkWithElliot.com. So if you go to TravelTalkWithElliot.com, that's the easiest way to find the podcast. Of course, it's on iHeartRadio as well. But if you go to TravelTalkWithElliot.com, you'll be able to find it right there. Anyways, I want to get right to my guest, and he's in the studio with me right now. Thomas Harbour, and I guess the best way to describe him is Thomas is an avid traveler. Thomas, you're not, you're not a tourist. You're a traveler. And I almost want to call you an explorer because so many of the places you go really are, are exploring, right? Uh, you, you've been from one pole to the other pretty much. Yes, indeed. I, I have been quite a few places that most people probably wouldn't have gone to. And so from that point of view, I can offer perhaps some insight into what it would be like to go to those places. Yeah, and, and when you go, uh, let's, uh, I want to get to the, the, the North Korea, but let's talk a little bit about, uh, you went to the North Pole, and uh, I have to thank you because our sign is up there, and I'm so proud of that. I show it off to everybody all the time that uh, my Canada Cruise Ship Centre store has a sign that, was, that made it all the way to the North Pole. So what was it that you woke up one morning and said, ah, you know what, I, went, you know, I want to go see Santa Claus. I want to go to the North Pole. I mean, it's not about Santa Claus, obviously, but uh, what was the big draw to going to the North Pole? There are a couple ways to get to the North Pole. You can, you can fly to the North Pole. The Russians offer that service, but they also offer a unique thing where they rent out their a nuclear-powered icebreaker, the largest in the world, that will take you to the North Pole starting from Murmansk. And to me, that was a fascinating possibility to see what it would be like to go on such a large ship that is breaking ice continuously to the North Pole. So that's what I found very interesting. And and that would have been much more of an explorer type, you know, what it would have been like to the original people, possibly that, that well, obviously the original people couldn't take a ship through to the to the, uh, to the North Pole. But when, when, when icebreakers became available and the first people that wanted a, to get to the North Pole by a, by a ship you would have experienced that same kind of feeling and that experience that they would have had. Yes, indeed. You can. What the nice thing about a nuclear-powered icebreaker is, of course, these are tremendously powerful ships, and the they can reliably reach the pole, so you can actually plan a trip around it, whereas the original explorers had to jink and, and turn their way through the ice to try and make any progress. This ship has enough power you basically point it to the North Pole and away you go. So. Now, it's called 50 Years of Freedom. Uh, when you went on it, did you have any concern? I mean, it's nuclear-powered, right? It's, you're on a little nuclear vessel. Did that cross your mind at all? I guess, you know, the military ships are often uh, powered that way, and I guess the, uh, 
those in the military don't probably think about it, but I'm just thinking as a regular, you know, non-military person, uh, did that cross your mind? I'm sitting on this big nuclear power plant. Honestly, it did not because the crew was on the ship for a long, long period of time and they didn't seem to have any concern. And so I, I didn't, that really never crossed my mind. I just thought it was fascinating because we did a ship's tour. So you could go and you could see the, the nuclear power plant and you could see the big heavy equipment that turns turns the ship's screws. And to my mind, that was fascinating. And nuclear safety, I'm assuming, was totally catered for and never crossed my mind. Yeah, and you know, the Russians have a very different uh, outlook, I guess, than we do on it. I, I, I know when we went to St. Petersburg, uh, as we went into the harbor, we passed uh, the portable nuclear power plants that if they need a, a power for some reason up in Siberia, they can take this ship and they can power a whole area with this mobile power plant that they have. And even uh, power plants, <laughs> I often joke, uh, imagine going to Canada and see two big nuclear towers. We saw that in St. Petersburg and I went, Oh my God! Hey, kids, go play by the towers. Well, and it's just a part of life there, I guess. And and uh, uh, their safety record. Uh, I mean, Chernobyl was not a a, a a shining example, but in general, they I, I guess they're they're comfortable with it. Um, I, I'm going to take the break here, and then when we come back, I want to talk about the ship and the experience uh, of the ship and what you know when you got there, or what you expected. But we do have to take breaks, and uh, they come faster than we think here when we do this show. Uh, so we're going to take a break when we come back. Uh, my guest is Thomas Harbour. I, I, we call him an avid traveler, probably one of our most interesting guests uh, when it comes to going to unique locations around the planet. And we're going to take you around the planet. We're starting with the North Pole. We're going to end up in, uh, in North Korea with Thomas, and we're going to talk about his experiences along the way. And we're going to do that all in just a couple of minutes right here on News Talk Radio 580 CFRA. This is CFRA Travel Talk. The number to call is 521-TALK. That's 521-8255. Now, here's Elliot. Welcome back to Travel Talk with Elliot on News Talk Radio 580 CFRA. And uh, my guest is Thomas Harbour. Uh, we're talking about unique travel. And uh, uh, Thomas also caught a little boo-boo I just made. And I want to—I always come good for my boo-boos. Uh, our uh, special event that we're having with Emerald Waterways is on July 19th, obviously, not June 19th. We're past that. So it's July 19th, Emerald Waterways. Uh, if you have any interest in, in river cruises, if you've thought about it, you've heard about it, you haven't done one, and you know all over the world. And people say, well, how do I compare a river cruise to an ocean views cruise? Uh, the number one thing is uh, uh, river cruise ships go where ocean cruise ships can't and ocean ship ships go where river cruise ships can't. So it's not really something you compare in, in that. But Thomas, you were on probably one of the more unique ships. You were on a Russian nuclear icebreaker, uh, 50 Years of Freedom. You went to the North Pole. Uh, tell us about the ship itself. Uh, was it comfortable? That, I mean, I have these visions that you're sleeping on a little bunk, but you weren't. It was, uh, was it geared up just for tourism or what's its main purpose, uh, the ship? The main purpose of the ship is to support shipping on the northern sea route, which is basically the northeast passage across the northern part of Russia. But since uh, they've started renting out the ship in the summertime for these trips to the North Pole, it's been kitted out to support tourists. So the cabins are are totally comfortable. The food is good. There's gym facilities. So it's it's a great experience. Now, when you get there, so where do you start? Where does this take you from? Where, where's the starting you, point? You start in, Mur- in Helsinki. You fly to Murmansk. From Murmansk, which is the home part of the of the ship, you get on the ship there, and then basically you head almost in a straight line to the North Pole. Now, when uh, getting into Russia, I mean, obviously you had to go to Russia. What are the special, uh, you know, we, you have visas, et cetera. Uh, difficult to get, not so difficult to get. I mean, I know, I mean, the most obvious thing is you got to, you got to make sure you do everything the right way. Um, did you have any problems with, with that at all? I've I've gotten three recent years three visas for Russia, and it's never been an issue. Right. You just you just have to follow their rules, answer the questions properly, and uh, and they're quite happy to to, to have uh, have you there. Um, so you get there, you get on the ship. Uh, it starts heading out now. I mean, I'm sure there's no hairy man's leg competition. There's no rock climbing walls. There's no uh, Broadway on uh, Broadway across Russia show on. What what occupies your day when you're just sailing? This may seem strange, but just watching a ship move through two meters of ice, so breaking two meters of ice, 
mile after mile after mile is is incredibly fascinating <laughs> because the ice comes up in different different ways and it's just fascinating to watch it. The other thing that they have is they have a helicopter on board, so they do flight seeing trips. So by flight seeing, you take off, you cru- you fly around the ship, and you can watch the ship breaking ice from from a uh, remote view. So that gives you another perspective of what the ship is actually doing, and it, it makes it very interesting. What about wildlife? There is lots of wildlife to be seen. There are many polar bears, and we saw polar bears hunting seals. We saw polar bears swimming, and we saw polar bears just wandering on the ice. We saw walruses, seals. So basically all the northern wildlife, lots of birds. So basically all the northern li- wildlife is available to be seen on that type of trip. Now, how long is the, the, the actual ride until you get to the North Pole itself? Uh, it takes about three days. It's, it's just a three-day trip up. Uh, you get to the North Pole. Now, I imagine they do a, some, is there some enrichment lectures that you can go to and, uh, and, and discussions on, on what's going on and where you're going, et cetera? Absolutely. The, the, the guides on, or the support crew on, on the ship, not the Russian crew itself, which mans the ship, but the expedition staff is highly trained and they're very experienced. They, a lot of them have PhDs. So they, they give fascinating lectures on wildlife or geology and so from that point of view, if that's the type of thing that interests you, that goes on for most of the hours of the day. So that, that's another thing that you could profit from. Now, for the foodies that listen in, what's the food like up there? <laughs> I thought the food was very good. I mean, it it's, uh, has a Russian twist to it, but they're, it's totally acceptable. There's, there's no issues with it. I found it very interesting. Weather-wise, what, what did you encounter? And I guess what, what are some of the extremes you might encounter there? It's very, the weather is very variable in the sense that clouds can come in at any time. So the flight scene trips, sometimes you're waiting in line to, to board the helicopter and a fog bank rolls in and that's it for your flight scene trip. But they'll pick it up no matter what the hour. So maybe later on that evening, the skies will clear and they'll resume the flight scene operations. So we got two flight scene trips while we were there. Now, like Alaska, I guess you have a lot of light, right? Is it depending on the time of year and a, and a, light, a lot of dark at other times? Yeah, this is summer. So it's virtually 24 hours, hours of, of, sun, uh, of, of sun. Did you have to adjust to that? I mean, were you able to get to bed at, at your normal time or did you just... I mean, I think I'd be so excited if I was up there. It wouldn't matter dark or light. I'd, 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 I'd be up and wanted to, to see things. But is it easy to get your, your, your sleep? I don't think that that really should be an issue because you can easily close the blinds right. or put up some heavier material if that's if that's a problem. But the, as you say, it, it is very interesting, and no matter what the hour, you have light to see something. Whereas down here, when it gets dark, you're not going to see very easily. But up there, you have light virtually 24 hours a day to see what there is to be seen. Dress code. It's casual. But when you step outside, you've got to have – uh, they, do they give you a – I know on some of them, I often joke that you must have a closet of – because many of the trips you take, they give you a parka, an appropriate parka to wear. And, and it's, uh, I, I figure you must have 10 or 12 of these hung up that are all from different cruise lines and ships. Um, you got to wear that parka out there. I mean, how warm did it get or how cold did it get when you were there? It's summertime in the Arctic, and maybe if you haven't been to the Arctic, it may not be obvious, but in the summertime – when the sun is out, the Ar- Arctic is quite pleasant. So when the sun isn't out or when there's a bit of a wind, then the parkas that they do issue you with, they work fine. Right. Uh, you know, and it, it's funny because we do a sell a lot of Alaska and a lot of people, I don't want to go to Alaska. I don't, it's it's going to be freezing. It's going to be in the summer there. It can be, uh, you know, I've had guests call me in August or email me in August going, you know, it's 26 degrees up here today. So it's, as, as, as you say, it, it's the sun is shining up there. It's nice and warm. You've got, you know, your, your protective clothing. So you get to the North Pole, the actual North Pole, right? This is the real McCoy. It, it, it's, uh, Zero degrees, whatever the uh, – what's up there? What, what is it? What, what's okay, so the captain takes great pride in putting the bow of the ship exactly on 90 degrees north. So if you watch the GPS they have on the bridge, he will maneuver the ship until it reads 90 degrees north. And then once – he has to perhaps move it from that position because he needs to have ice thick enough for the off-ship activities. So he maneuvers it like whatever it takes, a mile or two, where he gets ice that's strong enough – and then you do an off off ship activity. So it could be well, it is a lunch. You have a lunch out there. There's a polar dip. So if you want to do a polar plunge, you can do that in the in the stern of the ship. 
And they also had a uh, balloon. So if you want to do a hot air balloon at essentially the North Pole, that's another option too. So uh, yeah, I noticed that you had a hot air balloon in, in your photograph. There's a hot air balloon in the background and that you just take it up. Now, it's, there's, you don't see anything. I mean, there's not, nothing for miles around you, right, at, at any point really. Uh, uh, I guess as you get closer back to, to coming home, you do. But when you're up there, there's, it's just – flat is it or is there is there large yeah, chunks of flat. ice that are it's, yeah it's flat with pressure ridges because the ice is always moving it, it's not static there's no there's no ground under the north pole so it, it the ice is always moving you get pressure ridges but the other thing is you do get wildlife up at the north pole and that's why they have polar bear guards because polar bears can just wander past there they don't the north pole to them is neither here nor there now, without getting political and, and, and climate change, did you, when you were up there, did you, it, was, it wasn't that long ago, did you get any sense of, gee, this thing's all melting or it's not going to exist or, or uh, you know, because you mentioned that the, the ice at some points wasn't very thick uh, or thick enough to support your group. How many people were on the ship? The ship takes Ballpark. approximately about 120 people. Okay. So, you know, I'm thinking 120, it doesn't have to be that thick to, 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 to support the people, yet... You know, he may have to move to, to find that amount of thickness. Uh, is it just because it's the summer and that's the normal? Uh, it's or or the is there any is, comments about yeah, that? The ice is always on the move. So, so you get ice that opens and closes. So if the ice opens and then freezes over, the ice that just froze over will not be particularly thick. So what they're looking for is older ice that is thicker. Okay. So uh, you, you see the North Pole and then, you know, you're, you, you head back. Uh, is this the kind of trip uh, you'd say somebody has to be really in shape for? Is this what's the average kind of person that's up there that, that you were with? The average person is probably in uh, post fifty years old. There are some young people, but it's really sort of a trip that people tend to take after they've taken trips to many other destinations. Right, and you've done that, and we're going to uh, take a break here. And when we come back from the break. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of those other destinations. And be, just because sometimes I tend to run out of time, I really want to dive into the, the main reason I asked you here today to, to do the show. And that's, I was so fascinated by the fact that when you called me up and said, I'm going to North Korea, and I kind of went, yeah, okay, right, you're going to North Korea. I said, the real North Korea, yeah, you're going to North, or North Korea. So I want to talk about that experience uh, and what it was like, because I think a lot of us, it would probably be, an interesting place we'd want to go, but a kind of place we go, really, can I go there? I, I didn't realize I could even go there. Or do I really want to go there? Is it safe there? Uh, how comfortable am I going to be uh, when I go there? So we're going to talk about that right after the break, as long as you can stay around and you've got time uh, to be with us, which I, I think you do, right? Yes. We got you. Okay, excellent. That's all the time we have uh, on this segment. Uh, we'll be back. Thomas Harbour is with us. He's an avid traveler and one of our, our great guests and, and uh I asked him on the show to, to share his experiences, and we hope you're enjoying it. You can catch the, cod, the podcast, rather, of course, at uh, TravelTalkWithElliot.com, TravelTalkWithElliot.com. And don't forget, there's only two places you can get my team. That's Expedia Cruise Ship Centers in Canada and Expedia Cruise Ship Centers in Westboro. And uh, they're there to help you out. Uh, you can call the store at 831-9100. Close today. In the uh, in the fall, we sort of open up on the Sundays, but leave a message there. It's electronically sent to one of them, and uh, somebody will get a hold if you have any questions. It is uh, time for a break. We'll be back right after this on News Talk Radio 580 CFRA. This is CFRA Travel Talk. The number to call is 521-TALK. That's 521-8255. Now, here's Elliot. Welcome back. Just after the news here on News Talk Radio 580 CFRA. Elliot Finkelman with you on another Travel Talk with Elliot. And uh, I can't wait to tell you about my uh, most recent uh, trip and, and give you all the updates on, on Alaska. And uh, it's, uh, it's a trip that, uh, of course, I, I've been to Alaska, but it was more a sampler uh, than, than the real deal. And, and this trip, we're going to tell you about uh, the inland lodges that we went to, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm really, really looking forward to uh, coming back and discussing that with you. In the meantime, though, I've got somebody who does some really exciting travel with us. And uh, gentleman's name is Thomas Harbour. And off the air, I just mentioned, I said, you know, and I've known Thomas, I guess we've probably known each other three, four, five years now. Yes. And, 
and uh, uh, Thomas came to us, and when he first said his name, Harbor, and I spelt it out, and it's Harbor, just like Harbor, he goes, yeah, Harbor, and I went, it's, it's there's kind of an irony there, right? It's it's like um, one of the gentlemen who's in uh, one of the big shots, I guess, if you will, at uh, Holland America, his name is Cruz, <laughs> right? His last name is Cruz, uh, so kind of fits, and I guess maybe if you sold cars and your last name was Car, you know, uh, it, 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 it happens sometimes. Um, so we were just talking about, you know, your trip to, to Russia, or not to, well, you went through Russia, but to, to, to the North Pole. And now you've decided uh, a couple of weeks ago, you phoned us up and you said, Elliot, I'm, I'm thinking of going, uh, or I am, well, I want to go. There's a trip, a, a tour I've seen and I'm interested in. It. And it was to North Korea and I kind of went, really, wow, like oh, Dennis Rodman, is he a buddy? I mean, you know, <laughs> he goes there. Um, so tell me about this again. Uh, how did you think of North Korea? Why did you want to go there? What, what, what came to your mind uh, that, that brought you there? Well, basically, I'm, North Korea is, is in the news quite a bit. And there is a, an, uh, a certain uh, impression given of North Korea. And I was curious to see if, if that, what you read about in the news, is generally a good impression of the country. So it's so kind of Donald Trump would say, is it fake news or not, right? And, and Right. How much is it slanted, basically? How, how much is it? And, you know, when you... but. And let me ask you, when you go as a tourist, and, and, and I hate using that word tourist with you because I, I, to me, I separate travelers and tourists. You're a traveler. You're not just a, a tourist. You get into the nitty gritties and, 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 and the back end of things. Um, without asking, I'll ask you the ultimate question at the other end, which is, is it what we see? But um, when you got there and, and got off the plane, uh, did you think? Uh, did you think you got the real deal? Do you think you got the real impression? Were you able to go? Uh, you know, outside of that, the the tourist focus that they they, they make you have. I'm assuming they do. Uh, you know, like sometimes in Russia, you don't necessarily when you're on the tours. You know, you don't get to see the the whole Russia really necessarily, um, and so maybe you get a tainted view of it. Uh, were you able to get and and see the the big view of like a, a Korean might, like a North Korean might? The answer to that is is really not not that much because. They put you in a bubble. You're always accompanied by a guide. The purpose of the guide is to ensure as best that that guide can that you're given a positive impression of the country and the best face of the country is put forward. However, they have to transport you around from place to place. So if you keep your eyes open of, of what you're passing by, you can get a, a pretty good impression of, of how what the life of the people is like. As well, if you just look at... The type of paintings, the type of images they show you, you can also get a very good idea of what is very important to them. Right. So let's start uh, again with, with your trip. Where do you fly into to, to, uh, to get there? Most people fly from Beijing in China to Pyongyang. So it, it's flown in on uh, Air Corio, which is the Korean national airline, which actually has is the only one-star airline in the world on Skytrax. It was a, it's a one star? Yes, a one star. How do you get, how can you, you see, I don't get that. How can you be one star and still like get a plane off the ground, right? It, it's, <laughs> I guess, it how probably, bad was it? How bad it, was it? Actually, it was, there wasn't, there really wasn't an issue. It, it was just like any other, any other flight. But I guess over time, based on service quality, that's, probably the knock against them but but it's a short flight it's only a two-hour flight i shouldn't say this but i don't trust sky tracks because i don't want to tell you who gets five stars and i'm not sure that they deserve five stars either so maybe the one star isn't deserved either at the other end of the pile uh okay so you fly in uh from beijing uh did you spend any time in beijing or you just uh i spent a day in beijing right right uh, not enough time right are you going to head back or yeah that was my second time to right. beijing so yeah beijing is a fascinating city and well worth a visit for right. sure so now you, 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 you land, uh, do they welcome you with open arms, say, hey, welcome, uh, how, how's that go? The guide's waiting for you? Your guides are waiting for you. First, you've got to go through customs, and they're very concerned if you're bringing any printed material into the country that they feel may, uh, you know, it's subversive or, or gives a bad uh, impression of the country and that you might leave behind. So they're very concerned about that. Cameras, computers... They're not, they're not particularly concerned about those. It's really printed material they seem to be really concerned about. Internet in North Korea, yes, no? There is. We never encountered Internet. And if you did encounter, the, basically the Koreans themselves, the North Koreans, do not have access to the Internet. They have access to an intranet, 
which stays within North Korea itself. Right, but they don't have the internet as we do, so no. they're fed what they... Now, what about the uh, media there? Is it broadcasting? Is it one channel? Is it all... It's all state-controlled, obviously. Yes, but. there. there's a couple of channels, but if you don't speak the language, then watching North Korean TV is... is you're just watching images. This may sound a, like a, an odd question, but... And, and maybe you, you, you... When you saw any of the... Tele- do they have the comedy shows, or is, or is, there, or is that... That just... Is a TV very serious TV all the time? I just have these visions that there's no, you know, uh, no sitcom going on. There's no Seinfeld. They're equivalent, you know? I honestly couldn't say. All I know is, in general, the tone of... There's lots of propaganda in the country. So there's propaganda posters everywhere. At lunch and dinner, they would show us DVDs as we were eating. And again, they're, they're straight propaganda. So what we saw was heavy on 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 the propaganda and there was no chuckles <laughs> in right. that in that propaganda there was a lot of scenes of the uh, people's army in action there was lots of scenes of missile missile launches so it was quite clear they were trying to send a message that they're a strong military country and they need to be respected now you mentioned as you look around what did you see as you looked around did you um you know they taking you through different areas did you see a lot of high tech uh, knowledge? Did you see a modern society, or did you see something that is, is you know, obviously, you know, back backwoodsy? Pyongyang is a a very futuristic looking city. It, if you took it out of a science fiction novel, you'd say this is a really a, this is what I imagine the a city of the future would look like. They have very modern looking buildings, and uh, for both science and for apartments, but we only see the outside. So when you, if you were able to go in the inside of the apartments, people who have done that have reported that there's issues like with electricity, with plumbing. But from the exterior, there, it's a very futuristic-looking city. Now, you were in the city. Did you get out to the countryside at all? Yes. That, and so that's the interesting thing because Pyongyang is sort of the center of the, of the country where a lot of the elites live. And so they have access to what we would consider – modern modern amenities like shops and that kind of stuff. But when you get out to the country, you see the peasants. And I don't, I'm not trying to insult them by calling them peasants, but that's essentially what they are. They're peasants, farmers, who are using farming techniques that haven't essentially changed since the time of the pharaohs. They have oxen pulling scratch plows, and you see that everywhere you go. So there's a, a farmer with an ox, plowing the ground behind them you see the generally their women and they're either broadcasting seeds or they're kneeling down and planting seeds individually wow. in the ground now what about automobiles that type of thing uh what kind of cars are they driving not kias right right okay so <laughs> so most people have no access to cars so okay. if you go to pyongyang you will and go to the countryside you will see people either walking most of the people are either walking or using a bicycle However, the elites and the army, because the army is the highest priority in the country, they are driving around in very, uh, very modern automobiles that range from, we saw Mercedes, BMWs, uh, Fords. So they have a access to very modern automobiles. Now, the, uh, you know, uh, you've got a, a bit of a blog, and I don't know if we want to mention, uh, you, you have a, a YouTube channel, do you not? Yes, uh, yeah, and and it's fascinating, and, and I think maybe if we um, do you mind if we give out the uh, uh, a link if people want to look uh, to it. No, not uh, at all. Yeah, because you've got some fascinating. Uh, Thomas Harbour is our guest, by the way, and if you're just tuning in, and uh, Thomas is a, a world traveler. Uh, we talked about his trip uh, to the North Pole. Now we're talking with him about his trip to North Korea, and he does fabulous, fabulous travel logs. And, uh, you know, even if you're just an armchair traveler and you want to see what it's like, uh, you can go. Now, what's your YouTube channel? Because I, I think that's you do a great job on right. those. So if, if you just uh, access YouTube and you just put in, in one, one word, T-L-E-T-T-E-R, T-letter, then that'll take you to my channel. Okay, so and, T-letter, just, yep, just to simplify. T-letter, that. one word. T-letter, one word. And uh, one of your, and you know, I, and, and I, I love when I get these, when you're away and you send me the, the quick little, you know, here's a little bit of our trip and you've got some great photos. And there's a shot here of some office workers and they're sweeping the, the sidewalk. And it looks more like it's something out of a movie, 
than a reality. They're all in their heels. They all look like they're pretty well-dressed, but they've got these little straw brooms sweeping in front of the streets. Right. So the, the, what I, uh, the conclusion I came to is okay, so when the office workers or the workers show up in the morning, they sweep in front of their building with these, as you say, these short little brooms. And in my mind, what I, I took that to mean is they're trying to reinforce the idea in the people's minds that they are subservient to the state. So they give them little brooms to sweep with, which sort of makes them crouch down and sort of reinforces the idea that they are servants of, of the state. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and I see you here sitting with a couple of soldiers. And uh, mind you, their faces are fully covered, but you kind of, kind of see that they're smiling under there. Or they look like they're smiling anyways. Did you feel afraid at all when you were there? I mean, uh, you know, I've been to some countries where there's a lot of military presence around and it kind of unnerves you a little bit sometimes. Uh, but these guys look like they're kind of having fun. Right. So in, in North Korea, the North Korea has the biggest, one of the biggest standing, I think it is the biggest standing army in the world. So it doesn't matter where you go in North Korea, you will see people wearing army uniforms. But all those people aren't necessarily in the part of the army that has weapons, there's a lot of them that do construction work. They work on farms, but they're, they're throughout the country. And some of them are very serious, depending on what their job is, and uh, some of them are not that serious in the sense that they're not doing a, a hard military job. They're doing a construction job or they're doing a farm job. So but they're depends. ready if the Americans come and get them, right? They're just ready to go all the time. There is... That is one of the constant themes in North Korea is we must be prepared to repel the U.S. invaders and their South Korean allies. That is that you see that everywhere in the country. Now, underlying all of that, when you travel, um, you know, you see what you're presented, but you can see the eyes of people and you can see the 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 the, the, the way they look. Well, do you have any thoughts on that, the people you saw? I mean, are these people going, yeah, I've got to sweep again, I'm doing this, but, you know, what kind of lives do they have in there, is it? Okay, so if if you were in a country like North Korea where from the time you were born, you were indoctrinated that on a certain worldview, you have no other source of information but that which the government presents to you, at least legally you don't. There are right. some bootleg DVDs and that kind of things from the West. But if that's what you're presented with, it's, it's very hard to imagine that you would not believe very strongly in what you've been fed since you were a little taught. Right. So coming from Canada, going there, what, what was your general thought? Because we're going to actually, you know what, let's take a break. When we come back, I, I want to ask you about that question because I'm going to take the break now and then we'll come back and uh, we've got one more uh, segment left in the show. And uh, I'm with Thomas Harbour, avid traveler, Great guest of ours, and, and I really appreciate him taking his hour of his life here to come and tell us about some of his travels. And uh, we've got a lot more we can talk to you about because you did, we, we've only talked about two of the places you've been to, but we are going to run out of time, and, and uh, uh, hopefully we can convince you to come back again and, and join us. Don't forget, you can get the podcast at www. TravelTalkWithElliot.com. And actually, you don't even need the WWWs anymore on the internet. Just put TravelTalkWithElliot.com um, and, and you'll, uh, you'll get to, to the site and you can get the podcast. And uh, don't forget to check out Thomas's uh, YouTube channel. It's T Letter. Just go to YouTube and search for T Letter and you'll see all, uh, all kinds. I mean, Iceland, you've been to, you've been down to Polynesia, uh, you were in Russia, you've been to China, you've been. So you've got a lot of different. Uh, and there's probably a couple I'm, I'm leaving out there. So when we come back from the break, though, I do want to ask Thomas what it was like being a Canadian in North Korea and sort of what does that do from, from the heart uh, uh, to make you think. That's all the time uh, for this segment. We'll be back right after this on News Talk Radio 580 CFRA. This is CFRA Travel Talk. The number to call is 521-TALK. That's 521-8255. Now, here's Elliot. Welcome back to Travel Talk with Elliot. As usual, time flies by on this show, and we're going to run out of it. So I'm going to get right into the questions. Our guest is Thomas Harbour, and uh, he's with us talking about his trip to North Korea. Thomas, just before the break, I asked you, you know, you're Canadian, you're traveling there. You come back, what do you think? Okay, so when we left North Korea, so... I left North Korea and, and entered Russia, and when I entered Russia, it was like returning to the land of freedom because there was no guide telling you what you could not could not do, deleting your pictures if, if the, they figured the picture you took was a, a not going to show North Korea in the best light. 
So it, it is amazing to leave a country like that and, and go to a country like Canada. It's fascinating because you said, you know, I left, I left North Korea, went to Russia, and I felt the freedom. And can you imagine that 20 years ago or 30, 40 years ago, somebody might have said that, that, you know, Russia felt like freedom compared to – that's how the, the, the difference is between the, uh, the countries. Um, one thing we didn't touch on, and uh, I, I think uh, – you mentioned it to me uh, during our break, was the veneration of the Kims. I love the way you, you expressed it that way. Uh, these guys are everywhere, right? And they are, they are gods. Their images are, are everywhere. There's statues to them. There's murals. There's posters. And if you do not treat those, those images with respect, then you're in a lot of trouble. Because for all intents and purposes, they are godlike in, in uh, how they're treated. Now, you, you, I guess, you know, you walk around, you must see posters of them. You must see statues of them. They're on television all the time. Is the whole family uh, put on that pedestal? The, the main players are, are the father, Kim Il-sung, his son, Kim Jong-il, and not so much uh, Kim Jong-un, who is the current leader. He doesn't appear in, in a lot of these posters, but the, the original father and his son certainly do. And uh, Kim Il-sung's wife also appears from time to time. Now, you went in a group, in a travel group. How many people were, uh, were on your group? It, it varied because we, we had a longer tour, so people dropped off as we went along. But overall, we had that about 15 people. doesn't sound good. <laughs> 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 Rough trip, you know. Yeah, they dropped off. Uh, uh, approximately 50? 15. 15 people. Uh, did this company you use, did they, did they do this uh, all the time? Is it yes. A, is it a yes. There's several com- companies that take uh, visitors to North Korea. Right. Did you, uh, and you felt safe the whole time? You really weren't, uh, I mean, you felt odd, I'm sure, uh, being, you know, always constantly under watch. But as far as actually, you know, did anybody, were you with a group of Canadians or Americans as well? No, oh, I was the only Canadian. Mainly they were Germans. Ah, okay. Okay. I'm just wondering if, you know, uh, how that was viewed, you know, did anybody, you know, were they ever, were you ever concerned that and somebody might think I'm an American and that's not a good thing? I, I, there was no real hostility from the local populace, although the local populace, if you take their picture and sort of you didn't get pre-approval of by them, then they could report you. That would get back to the guides and then the guides would take your camera and uh, review the picture and perhaps have you delete it. Right, right. So they didn't take your whole camera, though. You know, I, I've got to. Uh, I'm just looking at your uh, update that you sent me, and uh, you mentioned that after Korea, you went to uh, you went to Russia, and you've got a picture of a helicopter here, the white helicopter. Uh, I I don't know if you remember right. the picture mm-hmm. there, and it brings back a memory to me. Uh, this one's nice and clean. When I was in Russia at the Naval Museum, they had one sitting there, and I'm sure it's the same model. And I walked up to the guy and I said, "Wow, this is kind of fascinating. Can I look at this?" And he says, "You want to ride?" And I said, "Yeah, right. I get to ride in that old thing. Like, how old is?" It? He goes, "No, he's new," <laughs> and it looked like it was built 40 years ago, right? And they actually were offering rides. Rides in it, and just seeing your picture uh, uh, made me uh, made me think about it. I just want to make that comment right. about uh, the technology. Again, you probably noticed too when you go to those countries. It's a real um, um, I don't know what the right words dichotomy, but between as you say, one part of the country is very ultra modern, the other side of the country is 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 back in in the you know back forty fifty years uh, ago. Right. So the emphasis on on North Korea in North Korea appears to be on Pyongyang, making sure that it has very modern facilities, whereas out in the rural areas, the emphasis is simply on food production, and there is not that much money spent on modernizing food production. We saw very few tractors. It was mainly oxen, because a lot of the money is, if we're honest, a lot of the money is going to the nuclear program and to the ICBM program. Yeah, because, I mean, given that country's probable lack of GDP and, and what they actually produce... To, to to pay for all of that, uh, the military uh, uh, technology that they're, you know, they're espousing is, is I'm sure, uh, coming from the pockets of the poor people. Right. So the the policy the the policy is the principal policy is military first policy. The military has the first dibs on any resource it needs in order to protect the country from the uh, assumed aggressors. Thomas, that's all the time we've got, and, and, and I'm hoping I can convince you to come back again, and we'll do another, uh, another hour with you on some of the other fascinating places. If you had to pick one place you've been already, and you say, you know what, that's, 
That's the one I'm so glad I did and got done. I'm putting on the spot. What would you say? Antarctica is always Antarctica and, and the southern the islands in the South Atlantic are very fascinating. Excellent. Well, maybe we can get you back and talk about that. That is absolutely all the time we have on this week on uh, Travel Talk with Elliot. I uh, hope to be uh, back live with you next week and uh, telling you about our adventures up in Alaska and uh, the Yukon too. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, letting you know about what it was like to uh, take the train into the into Yukon as well. But that is all the time for this week. Don't forget, Expedia Cruise Ship Centers, Canada and Westboro is where you get my great team. And we'll talk to you uh, during the week there. And uh, right here next week on News Talk Radio 580 CFRA. You've been listening to 580 CFRA Travel Talk, presented in part by Expedia Cruise Ship Centers, Canada and Westboro locations. You can reach Elliot at TravelTalkWithElliot.com. Somewhere nice to some tired island in your heart called paradise.